Like that? Okay. Okay, so let me repeat. Let's get this thing started before the fire marshal shows up, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so um, um, I just wanted to kind of remind you that after the presentation, there will be a little bit of time for questions uh, and answers, and then, of course, we will um, migrate not only to the snacks, and then, of course, to see the great uh, kind of exhibit that has been put together um, by uh, Payette. So um, I wanted to, I had got some, um, I just wanted to, I had some prepared words that I wanted to say about uh, some of the things that are kind of going on uh, in the show, and I just wanted to try to contextualize a little bit why I think um, having this work of Payette here at Roger Williams is so important for, for us uh, as um, kind of academics and the students uh, yourselves, uh, because I think that this kind of will provide for a different opportunity of, of how to think about architecture. So I was thinking that, um, and I'll try to make this as brief as possible, um, that anybody who knows me uh, knows that I have been thinking a lot about utopias and visionary architecture. And while I don't want to claim that this uh, work that we are about to see seeks to be utopic in any way, uh, the operations and concerns that we will kind of be presented with, with um, they point towards a utopic sensibility. And by, by that I mean that it is utopia thought of not as a noun, but as an adjective, uh, as a way of connecting to the world. So um, to arrive at the work's intent, uh, the work of Payette, the work that we will see uh, and hear about tonight, um, to the intent which is, of course, outside of the particularities of architecture, planning, landscape, and construction, we have to look beyond the technical, the organizational, and the programmatic. Because as we know, those, those things represent a total surrender to instrumentality, which ultimately leads to the closure of thought and possibilities. So we have to look beyond that, uh, because what the intent is, the intent of the work, is to be centered on the user. And this is the most important thing, I think, about the work of um, Payette. Uh, the user is the student. The user is the hospital patient. The user is the researcher, the academic, or perhaps the medical practitioner. And through a consciousness of the possibilities enabled by design and by the design of the environment and the negotiations with the client and the so-called value engineers, the architecture of Payette enables the user to shift or to move from their existing futures to new possible futures. This is how I would define the work of Payette. This is how I would define the utopian condition of this work. It enables or enacts possible futures. This labor has been present since the firm's foundation in 1932 under the banner, banner of scientific management as a tool to reinvent healthcare facilities. And the firm's current leaders and associates, including Leon Drachman, have continued this trajectory. And while I should tell you that Leon Drachman is a Uruguayan architect who received his BARC from, from the Technion, Technion Israel Institute of Technology and his MAUD uh, from the Graduate School of Design and, and has been at Payette since 1998, I will not. Because that would mean that I would need to introduce all of Payette's principles and people who allow for possible futures to exist. And I think that Leon will tell you that and that the firm is the recipient of the 2019 AIA Architecture Firm Award and the 2019 Holliston Parker Award for the most beautiful building in Boston. Please join me in welcoming Leon Drachman and thanking him and the firm of Payette and all of the principals and associates for the opportunity to see this work and to have this beautiful exhibition kind of around us to, to kind of like inspire us. So please help me welcome him. Good evening. Um, Luis said uh, uh, a bunch of things that I, oh, I was planning on saying, but I'm not going to say them anymore. Um, first of all, it's great to be here. Um, thank you for 
having us. Um, I've been here a few times for studio reviews, and, which was excellent. We have Roger Williams graduates working with us at Payette. We've had a few over the years, and a few of them are here. Um, Jake and Garrett. Carolyn is not here. Um, we're also close with uh, Gary, Gary Graham, who's a former Payette employee. Actually, he likes to tell those stories of a few decades ago. And we're collaborating. I'm very happy to be collaborating with Gary and his firm on some projects now. So we have some links, important links, to, to this institution. Um, so I'm here today, but it could be any of the a number of leaders of the firm could be given this talk. Um, and I, I volunteered because I, I thought it was an interesting uh, exercise to try to kind of frame the work of an enormous firm uh, and put it into an hour's worth of, of, of time. And I'm not going to uh, kind of do a kind of a, a, a exhaustive uh, survey of the firm's work. Uh, but I'm going to pick a couple of themes and, and try to kind of play with them a little bit to show you along the way some of our work and explain to you a little bit how we work. And the title of the talk um, is, is, is fairly simple. These are all very, very basic words. And I think um, that is actually very important. Um, we deal with very complex problems. Um, the profession deals with complex problems, but in particular, the work that we do at Payette deal with programs that are technically demanding and challenging. Um, they are expensive. They are long. They are large. It's a lot of work. Um, and, and the more, I believe, the more we, we get sophisticated about them, the more we learn about new tools and techniques and materials and complexity of programs and get fancy with software and with uh, innovation, the more I think these are the, the terms that keep coming back and hopefully define really our work. So um, again, the, 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 the first three words are very, sim very simple. The fourth one, performance, is something that in itself is evolving. We're investing quite a bit in that kind of concept. And the concept is more than just the uh, technical performance of the buildings. It's really a, a kind of a humanistic enterprise at the end of the day, the one that we're embarking on. So that's kind of the essence. I'm not going to go through those in particular, but please keep those in mind as you see the work. And you, hopefully, you'll see what I'm talking about. So first, I'm going to uh, give you a 87 years of history in 10 minutes. And um, I'm going to give you a very, very brief introduction to who we are before we jump in and, and, and show you some of the work. The angle is a little challenging here. So we're located in Boston. We are all together under one roof. And that is very important to us. Um, we have an integrated practice. And what that means is we believe that uh, conventional architectural design and planning and landscape and interiors, they're all one thing. And, and we do it all. And we do it all in an integrated fashion, it's as simple as that. We do focus on uh, science and healthcare, and most of our work is uh, on those fields. Uh, you probably saw, if you didn't, please do so uh, over the next few days, the exhibit. Um, uh, go through that work, and you'll understand a little bit more about the fusion of design and performance and what we mean by that. I think it's, it's kind of a theme that has been evolving over the last few years, and we really believe in that. Um, so these are the, I believe it's 87 years uh, on a timeline. Uh, really, uh, uh, Tom Payette really founded the firm that, as we know it today, uh, 55 years ago in 1974. Um, and th there was a, there has been a leadership kind of intergenerational transition that has been going on for 25 years or so, and and that's how we're run. We have. Uh, right now, 15 uh, principals um, leading the firm, and the firm of 170 people. Widely recognized, and we're very proud. This is not why we do what we do, but it's, it's important the reinforcement that we get by winning some of those important awards. 
including the one Luis mentioned, uh, the, the firm award this year. Um, we do believe in a few key things, and other firms can say this too, but we actually uh, live it uh, every day. Uh, the kind of collaborative nature of our work, it's again, the complexity calls for it. We can't do anything with small teams. We need a lot of voices. Uh, diversity is a, is a key generator of our work and thinking. Um, and um, one of the themes that actually uh, is developing, um, constantly developing in, in the firm, is this notion of uh, architecture that uh, even when, it, when you look at it, it looks very, very diverse. Uh, there's no single style. We come from a tradition uh, of, of kind of fairly uh, orthodox modernis modernism um, from the work that uh, Tom in particular led in the, in the 70s and 80s. Um, but really, the buildings look like what they have to look like to do what they need to do. Uh, we, we don't follow a style or a single design leader when it comes to form, for example. And, and really, the sensitivity to the environment, understood as the, in the, in the widest possible sense, um, is, is, is what, what traditionally this firm has actually been about. And, and uh, it turns out that we've been doing evidence-based design and practicing sustainability decades before those terms even existed. Uh, we, it, we, uh, this, despite that, we actually formalized that effort and invested in what we call the engine, which is a group of building scientists that are embedded in our practice, inform pretty much everything we do um, and, and it, it's kind of an incredible force that permeates um, all our work. Um, and um, that includes uh, direct assistance to our clients, to our own teams, uh, to the profession in general. Um, we also embark on original research, actual research that we sponsor, um, uh, often ourselves, sometimes with outside funds. And, and that is kind of a decentralized effort and, and a large portion of, of the staff participates in that research. Um, and um, it's, it's been kind of a very important force that again informs the work in a very direct way. As that has been going on, um, the result is not only more design awards, but actually is a performance uh, transformation of, of the buildings we design. And this is, this is a, a, a not unique to our firm, but we are kind of leading the leading this effort, and and I think the impact on our work has been more pronounced than than what you see in the industry in general, and um, uh, we 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 take this actually very very seriously. The the amount of energy that our buildings consume, for example, is one of the measures, but you could see that it's a dramatic uh, a dramatic change. Along with that. Um, Park is here somewhere. There you are. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, we have um, also invested quite a bit in fabrication. And this is beyond just testing things with models, which we've done forever and we still do and love. Uh, but actually uh, it launch kind of a fabrication lab, a, a space that is dedicated to this with real instrumentation and with training and know-how. Uh, with hardware and, and software that, that actually is embedded in our practice, and you can see an, an image of what that space looks like. That is, that is brought back to, to the studio and embedded into our projects, and beyond that is also used to collaborate and engage with the builders themselves and, and kind of accomplish the, the ideas of the design uh, in a hands-on way. And, and that takes a lot of work and it takes people who like to build and break things, and, and, and that's part of our work. Uh, landscape is, has always been fundamental to what we do, um, and um, it, it's embedded in m most of our work. Uh, we, we do landscape uh, design kind of in-house. In Sometimes we, we get help from outside architects, uh, landscape architects as well. And uh, just a, the two images on the top, and Gary, you probably recognize those. That's in maybe 35 or 40 years ago in, in, in the Aga Khan University in, in, in uh, 
in Pakistan that while the design was going on, um, they, they were already nursing the, the, the vegetation that then when the building opened was so essential to the design itself. So that tells you pretty much how we, how we see landscape. So who's Payette? Um, that's Payette. Where do we come from? All over the place. Um, the yellow dots actually are the location of the work. The blue dots are people, uh, where they come from originally. I actually own three of those dots myself. <coughs> that was my contribution. Um, and it's a very diverse, uh, diverse community, and, and that's pretty essential. And that includes where we were actually trained and educated. And, and it's pretty amazing that the, the variety of schools that our, our staff comes from. Um, and some schools obviously provide more people, but there's a tremendous amount of variety in the source of, of, of the talent that we have in the firm, including three stellar people from this university currently um, in our staff. I believe, uh, again, diversity, but longevity is very important too, and we're, we're thankful that people stick around, and that's, that makes a big difference. People engage in their communities and, 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 and uh, give back. Um, Denise wanted to make sure that I have a YDC slide here, and I think, thank you, that was a great idea. Uh, this is a program we're very proud of, and, and not because we did it, this is a grassroots organization within the firm um, that organizes events and, and kind of really uh, welcomes new staff to the firm. Um, uh, and they take care of kind of uh, the cultural aspect of the firm is very much nurtured by, by this group. Uh, career development is very important, knowledge, sharing, um, social events, and so on. And it's an incredible resource uh, that actually is now being emulated by other firms, and we're very happy about that. So a couple, uh, just one minute about my own trajectory at Payette. I, over the weekend, I kind of mapped so, some of the projects I, I worked on and, and how that happened. And, and actually, I found it uh, fascinating to see um, what, what, do I, what do I learn about this. And, and there's a couple of things that I wanted to share, two things I wanted to share with you. One is um, how long these projects really take. We do, again, big, difficult projects. and. Uh, some of them are m more than one building, but the, the concept, the conception of a project can take a decade. So this is really a profession for uh, patient people, for sure. Um, the other thing is what you see there in, in the, the light blue dash, that's a planning phase. And this is very common in what we do. There's a lot of planning and master planning that goes on before you start designing, which is the middle blue, and the dark blue is the construction. And some projects go to constructions, others don't. Uh, in fact, the red dots there are openings of buildings. So you can see that there's, there's repeat kind of institutions where several buildings happen. But you can see that over 20 years, um, at least in my case, uh, there's only a handful of, 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 of large buildings that actually get built. And, and they are very precious. They are, uh, there are incredible opportunities, and we look at them that way, and I think you all should as well. Um, thankfully, there's a bunch that are coming up, hopefully, in, in the near future. So um, those are my 10 minutes about Payette. Um, I'll be happy to answer questions about that uh, towards the end if you have any other specific. Um, there's uh, two things I wanted to do now is to talk a little bit about two of the main areas of uh, attention of the firm. One is campus. Um, we do a lot of work for academic institutions, uh, science buildings more than anything else, and they happen typically on a campus, so we are very much uh, interested in that as, as a kind of a microcosm of, of, of the world, really. Uh, so we're going to discuss two or three projects there uh, to see some projects that actually have been able to transform campus with, with very precise means. And then we'll talk about healthcare, uh, and, and, and I'll discuss kind of nature as a healing force of design, and, and we'll see a couple of examples of that. Then at the end, we'll do a little kind of diversion in, into a, in, into a uh, 
a kind of a mini program at the end. Um, so converging the efforts of architects that do buildings and landscape architects and planners, um, uh, we do believe, and it's a kind of a, an optimistic view of building on a campus, and, it, it, and buildings do transform them, and, and uh, it, we don't do it, the institutions do it, they hire us to help them. But there is a, uh, it's a fascinating process to see. It's a kind of a controlled environment versus a city. When you build in a city, there's forces that are uh, really out of anybody's control. On campus, uh, uh, architecture is kind of controlled, and the planning is tighter, and it's more precise. And, and, and we think that's why it's kind of a very interesting experiment. Um, so we're going to look at a couple of, a, a couple of examples not of kind of inserting buildings in a campus, but actually of extending the realm and the reach of campuses. And I have three examples for that. The first one is the uh, building at Northeastern University, the um, uh, interdisciplinary science and engineering building that opened a year or two ago, um, a winner of the most prestigious awards in the region and in the country, really. Um, and, and what that building is really is the first of a pair of buildings. You can see that's the building that is built, the, what we call ISEC. And this is the, the second half of that long-term project. And that, pro that second half is actually under design now and I believe construction documents will be issued soon. So we really conceived of that as a pair. And what this is actually trying to do is extend the campus and cross the train tracks and establish kind of a new mini sub-campus on the other side to kind of reorient, really, the institution completely and create a kind of a, a, a front door, a smaller front door on, on the neighborhood side. So that's the train tracks. And this is a sub-campus. And for, for, for that to happen, then the buildings have to be spectacular. The spaces for people have to be spectacular. And the landscape ha has to be spectacular. And um, the, the, the first building turned out to be spectacular, and that's a good thing. Um, and the landscape is, almost, is only half done because the second building will complete it. But um, the landscape had to be as good or better as, as any piece of landscape on main campus to really hold its own and create kind of a worthy sub-campus. The interior of the buildings become destination in themselves. And this one is the first, uh, the ISEC one, which uh, it has, it turns out to be one of the best places on the entire campus. And people go to it uh, when they have an hour, a free hour uh, between classes just because they enjoy being in there. The other half of this problem was how to get to it. And, and there's a pedestrian bridge that was part of the plan that opened a few months ago. Um, and it's, it's a very uh, incredible piece of architecture in itself. Um, it, it's, a, it's a structural uh, kind of tour de force, and it's a, a kind of an experience to cross the tracks. And it's, it's, a, it's a nice, uh, it's not only a very easy way to go from point A to point B, but it's an experience uh, in itself. And it's designed in a way that the experience going from main campus to the sub-campus uh, feels this way, where there's an opening and glass, and you can see where you're going. But the experience going back is completely different just by the way that the material is organized. And, and the details, the lighting, the, the combination or the integration of structure with design, with finishes, with the ergonomics of people walking on the bridge, those are all part of the same problem. It's a beautiful experience. We're working on Penn State University on their main campus, which we see here, on a similar problem. Um, the uh, College of Engineering um, hired us to do a master plan last year uh, to see how they can grow on the core campus, but also how they can colonize that other place across this state uh, highway, really. It's, it's a very busy street. And the only way safely to go across there is through this building that exists, kind of bridges across. But you go to the other side, and there's, it, it's, 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 it's a bad array of buildings. It's, it's not a very good space right now. So what the institution wanted to do, and we helped them to conceive, was a, a kind of a, again, a spectacular place on the other side uh, of the highway 
to become a destination, to create a, a strong character, and landscape can do a lot, but the buildings are the greatest opportunity to make this happen. So the master plan concluded in, in an idea like this, which was you come from the bridge, arrive, uh, these are the three, build, the three new buildings, uh, West 1, West 2, and West 3, create a new quadrangle here and a new landing plaza, and between the two create this kind of amazing place. Then we were actually hired to design both buildings, and that's what we're doing now. So next time we come here for the next lecture, we'll show you what the building looks like. Um, but uh, the idea is then to take advantage of the pair of buildings by jointly creating something unique. And landscape-wise, that could have happened with kind of a series of open spaces and the buildings facing them, or organizing the buildings in a way that creates kind of a pedestrian promenade and a very well-defined quad. And that's what we're testing. You see the tools of our, of our analysis. Um, and the final idea is to actually use the frontage of these two buildings to together uh, create something unique and kind of amplify their impact. And, and that's, that's what we're kind of trying to do. And this is the kind of a current view of what, how the buildings are shaping up and how we're working hard on, on those buildings to actually together uh, conspire to create that opportunity. Third example is, is a project that is actually dear to me because I spent um, over a decade working on this. Um, is at Hershey Medical Center is the teaching hospital and uh, medical school of Penn State University on Hershey, Pennsylvania. And we were called to add uh, two, building, two clinical buildings and parking garage and, and other components. And uh, this is, this is the, the, the quad looks, the campus looked like that. This was all built in the late 60s, all together as one project. Very interesting, kind of a, a modernist, um, uh, kind of a design in a box type of, type of project with a very strong uh, character on the crescent uh, on, the, on, on, on the front of this, of this uh, the complex. And, and, the quest, and then in the 1970s, a small addition was in, introduced here on the east side. And that actually is the front door of the hospital, of the entire complex when we, when we came in. So there was a master plan uh, commissioned before, before our work uh, by HOK. And that's what they had recommended, placing the buildings this way, which means uh, a couple of buildings creating a kind of a entry court, basically, which essentially means there's an introverted way of entering. You enter this narrow place, there's a court, and then you're in. And that allowed for all the square footage that they needed. So what we wanted to do is, is rethink that and reverse it and completely change the equation and actually open up, do actually a very similar move, but completely opposite. Um, so what that resulted in is a series of projects that, again, took about a decade that uh, leaves, uh, they, they kind of leave the crescent where it is as an old artifact that is very important for the identity of the place, but creates kind of a completely new identity on the front side. And that is connected to the way you circulate, you enter and exit the place, the front door is unmistakable, and the new buildings are very proudly uh, framing that place. So again, a way of getting a couple of buildings and making the most out of them, but by combining their impact on, on the campus. So it's a tremendous amount of scope over the years. Here's a view of the first building, the Cancer Institute, the main entry lobby, and the children's hospital. So this is what you see when you come in. It's like an airport style kind of drop off sequence. It's, it's difficult to miss. And when, after you park and you come back, this is the view from the other side. So very different uh, but unified components <coughs> creating this kind of powerful set. So seen from space, it looks something like this. This is kind of the area of impact, an area equal to the rest of the, of the campus. And, and that's, that's the result. Basically, handling something that we try to do a lot is, is managing complexity with clarity. This is not a simple project, but it's a clear result. 
in a, in, in a medical institution, you can imagine how important clarity is uh, as, as opposed to uh, chaos and, and confusion. Now, the notion embedded in this design is also the concept of the garden hospital. Pieces are not only uh, uh, surrounded by gardens, but there's space in between every building. There's porosity in the plan. And there's gardens on roofs, between buildings, outside of buildings, and inside of the buildings. So that is uh, a concept that actually we will talk about a little more in a minute, but um, it's, it's essential to the, to, to the character of these medical institutions, the way, the way we perceive them. Um, and gardens, again, are uh, on roofs, are outside and inside of the buildings. Um, and the, the, they are transforming the way it feels to be in that place. And this is not only true for patients, but for staff, families, and, 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 uh, and so on. This is, for example, the healing garden outside of the Cancer Institute, the Cancer Center uh, infusion area. You can imagine the significance of, of having such a thing. So this is a segue into the second topic, which is the concept of using em embedding na nature in the planning and design of our, uh, of our buildings. And in particular, that's relevant for healthcare more than anything else. So I'll show you a few examples. Um, and it's all dating back, again, to the tradition of the firm and this issue of a, a uh, design that is always centered on the patient experience. We're going to look at two things. One is um, a couple of examples of healing with nature, uh, again, buildings that are embedded in, 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 in a natural setting. And then we're going to try to see if this scales up to, to something that is enormous in scale and how to handle that. So uh, again, we come from a long tradition of um, embedding nature into patient spaces. And there was a, a kind of an incredible series of hospital designs uh, from these, I would say, late 60s, the 70s and 80s. Uh, that the firm led by, by, by Tom Payette, um, really searching for that balance between the technical needs um, of the hospital uh, and a human place, a place for people to kind of uh, uh, heal uh, in, 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 in a kind of a very worthy environment. And a lot of that had to do with this looking for the shape of getting these patient wings uh, the maximum amount of natural light and sun and air and views and sky. And we had the opportunity of the, uh, uh, the last few years to actually test this in a couple of small um, uh, rising hospitals, basically two or three story buildings. And uh, one of them we're working with Gary right now. But I wanted to show them to you so you can see the, the, how they're actually following in this tradition of actually searching for how buildings shape themselves to work with the landscape. The first one is uh, a spinal cord injury center for the VA, 100, 100 patient rooms and clinical spaces uh, for people that are bound to wheelchairs. So what does that mean? Uh, from the outset, the, the, the goal was really to work on movement and independence so these patients can actually access the entire site and not depend on elevators to move from, from floor to floor. So the patient wings are actually embedded into the nature, uh, the same traditional way that, that the firm has been searching for, for decades. And there's a, the addition uh, of, of kind of courtyards inside of those wings to always give natural light to everybody in this, in this building. But importantly, the point was to have a two-story building that actually connects to the outdoors. And, and the way to do that was to actually form and shape the topography of the site, a very flat site. Force a topography that comes to meet the patient, as opposed to force the patient to go and search for it. And the movement of the patient seamlessly, horizontally, from wherever they are in the building would, would be able to actually cover the entire site. 
just that one concept kind of gave form to an architecture that is low. It had to be two stories. We couldn't do it in one. We would have done it in one. Um, but it's all about the nature reaching out and, and touching everybody in this institution. Um, and here's a view of, of that patient unit with the courtyard inside and getting all the, the patient rooms to face out, but all the staff and circulation to face into that courtyard. So everybody gets to participate. And then fill the, the, the site with uh, gardens, terraces, courtyards. And, and beyond that, design a landscape that is accessible to the patients for planting, for enjoying, for sitting. It's almost a, a ergonomic conception of landscape to be available to patients that are bound to a wheelchair. So the entire landscape design is based on that one concept. We're still waiting for this building to move into construction, and uh, it's been a few years, and we're patiently waiting. Another example is um, a um, psychiatry, psychiatry and, and behavioral health uh, hospital for an institution in New England that uh, we're not at liberty to disclose. We are working uh, with Gary and his firm on, on this one, a large, beautiful wooded site. And that was identified as the, the location for a 260-bed, um, fairly short, short-term stay for, again, psychiatry and, and behavioral health. And the building is, again, very complex, but the general idea ended up being the same. Get really the patient rooms to be as low, as close to the ground, and as open to the nature as possible. But beyond that, to really look at everything else on that site and make sure that everybody gets an amazing clarity about the, the landscape and to participate in the beautiful natural setting and one of the devices to do that, beyond what happens to the patients, is to really create this open loop of circulation where more or less everybody that has to go from any point to any other point in the building would actually walk along that uh, vector. And, and what that is, is really a piece of the forest that we're going to preserve and maintain right in the middle. So uh, to have an efficient way of circulating across the entire facility, but always oriented to that spot. So you can see that the, the buildings are kind of meandering through the topography, but right in the middle of the site is that patch of, uh, of, of original forest, untouched, right in the middle of the project. So the entire circulation is, has a common point of reference right there in the middle. And towards the end, that circulation would end in a very special place where you get the view of the outside forest. And that's actually a picture of that particular spot on the site. Now, contrary to this, the patients are not in that common space, but they are along the edges. And what they do get is a kind of a more of a controlled and private space, not inside, but outside of this complex. So uh, basically, the, the privacy and, and public nature of the space is reversed. So we're um, excited about where this project is going. And the question is, OK, that's very nice. It's, it's all one story, two story, very connected, very physically available. Can this scale up? So we tested that in something that we don't do too often, which is participate in design competitions. We decided to try it, and we, we won a couple of them. Um, actually, we picked two, and we won the two of them. And I think it's kind of a new thing for this generation at Payette to deal with projects in China, projects of this particular scale. But the, 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 the test was, can we actually embed, embed nature and base the design of a campus on that one concept, even for something that is 2,500 beds, 5 million square feet, uh, this amazing, incredible scale. Um, this one, this was the scheme that kind of won the competition. It had, the, uh, it was adjacent to a kind of a, a, a park that was in the form of a hill of a mountain. And this was the winning scheme, kind of a low podium for diagnostics and treatment and all the technical areas. And two patient <coughs> wings in the form of these two dragons that hover and float above it. It was as simple as that. Um, and, and the concept is, is this simple. There's a, the, the mountain park. And overlapping with the site, 
And the concept was, it's one site. So the hospital will be in that, in that mountain park. So can, can we force that? It's not easy because there's a lot of stuff that goes in a hospital and around the hospital. So, so landscape has to constantly be considered fighting against the natural tendency of paving everything and just putting buildings on them and driving around. So this is the concept of the, the, the two dragons framing that central space, and that central space is directly related to the mountain. And this is where the plan is today. That's the mountain, um, and, and it's like a flow of lava coming down the center uh, to create this amazing space, a multi-story space in between, in between the two halves of the hospital, uh, but also permeate every single place possible, roofs, courtyards, parks, gardens, uh, inside, above, and surrounding the site, and really, really force landscape to take over uh, as much as possible. Now, we still needed 2,500 rooms here, and how do you do that? So this is a very peculiar way of doing it, and, and it's actually working fairly well. Um, where patient rooms are only oriented um, to the east, south, and north, mostly to the east, um, and never to the west. And, and, and you could see here the circulation for the staff spaces is, is the darker purple. And, and that created this very dynamic way of organizing this lo long building that is divided into two halves, but each piece is divided into units around the circulation as well. The windows became an important consideration, and we used the windows as a concept to mediate between the enormous scale of the complex of the building and the intimate uh, scale of the patient. So including kind of uh, uh, screening the sun when you don't want it and maximizing views, introducing natural ventilation to reduce kind of the, the reliance on, on on mechanical, on, on mechanical ventilation and, air, and uh, air conditioning. And we created, e even if there's about 900 windows, um, each one becomes a mini world, a shelter, a place of intimacy for the patients. Now, it became such a generative place for the whole plan uh, that we want to actually test it and get it right. Even though this is in China, we built the actual full-scale mock-up here. Um, and Park and his team helped uh, actually get this done in, in the, the fab lab. This, these are the, the, the drawings. This is us trying to assemble this thing in the, in, in the office. And here's the team in China at a factory um, trying to test the, the, the first prototype. So this is actually, this is actually happening. It's very exciting. And the landscape here is based not only on providing green for everyone, but also to perform a function. Uh, shading, cooling, managing wind, and mostly managing water. Uh, water runoff is a big issue here, and, and there's plenty of precedent in that region of China where there's beautiful ways of terracing the landscape. And, and, and you can see here a section right through the center of that, of that plan, and an array of gardens, roof terraces, parks, and, 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 um, and courtyards. So this is the vision for the project, and this is the project under construction. So this is very exciting. Uh, two years ago, I think, we attempted this a second time, and we won a competition again to design a 500-bed hospital uh, in the south of China, a very, very different climate. Um, and uh, we won that competition, and, and it's it's almost under construction right now. So we're partnering with a Chinese firm uh, for the production of, of construction documents. So the highland of Henqin is, is, you can see, is right across from Macau. Uh, this is the Pearl River Delta in the south of China. And this valley used to be kind of all rice paddies, and it's been uh, dried up to a certain extent. Uh, they're keeping what they call a sponge city, which is a series of canals. Um, but they're kind of planning this as a new portion of town for, I think, 250,000 people. And what you see there is the medical campus, and, and uh, we are designing the main hospital in there. And this is the concept model for, from the competition. And, and the idea that we 
had here is to have the general hospital, which is really what the competition was about, turn its back to the city street and its front to a kind of a heart, uh, a green core, a heart in the middle of the, pl of, of, of the site, engaging the water canal that will cut across the middle and creating a campus and kind of collaborating with a future design of uh, five specialty hospitals, which we also competed for and also won and we're also designing right now. So we, we actually get to really look at the entire block. The timing is not completely concurrent, but it's, it's nice to be able to do both at the same time. And the concept of the massing here is a really a, a tower in the front of a low scale and a big patient tower in the back against the background of the gardens in, uh, close by and the mountains far away, kind of creating a, a new horizon, a new silhouette for, uh, for this hospital and create a very unique identity. This is how the hospital is put together. Again, a podium of uh, five stories that become a low tower here for uh, uh, research and administration and the patient tower hovering on top. So this, again, is uh, the canal that was uh, had to be located in this location. And this is a canal that we shaped, goes across, but kind of bridging on both sides of that canal is this central green heart that is so essential. It's a multi-story um, landscape place that is also uh, used to manage the water runoffs and, and control the winds and, and, and uh, using vegetation and mass to create a microclimate that is appropriate for uh, maximizing its use in a very hot and rainy region. region. Like we showed before in, in the uh, psychiatric hospital, the low portion of the plan is a very massive floor plate, but all the circulation is on the inside, and it's on the outside wall on the inside of the block. And again, that creates this common reference central garden for all to see as they move from point A to point B, uh, creating kind of a point of reference and helping with wayfinding, which is a very difficult challenge for people uh, in large medical hospitals, uh, medical centers of any kind. Again, multi uh, multiple uh, levels and degrees of uh, uh, intimacy and, and publicness for all these open spaces, beautiful gardens all over the place. Um, and, and gardens happen at different levels. So at, at the ground, main floor, connecting all the complex, but also at the drop off downstairs and on the roof upstairs. So you could see that, um, again, nature is, a, is an invading force that takes over everything that, that it can. And, and that's, that's kind of a, an obsessive way of designing and introducing nature. And it's the, the only way to really get to this kind of point. So can we scale up? Um, we think we can. And, and one of them is under construction. The other one is going to take a little longer. But um, we'll be back to re report uh, the results. So I think I have another 10-minute piece. I'm going to go quickly through it. What I've showed so far um, is really kind of the core of what we do, science building on campuses, uh, uh, hospitals, and medical centers. So that gives you an idea of some of the values we apply. Uh, we could have taken any other theme and discussed those with you. But I thought I would do a, a, a kind of a different take on some of the architecture that goes into our buildings. And I'm looking at super windows, which means buildings that actually have a, uh, the need <coughs> to have a large wall that is all made out of glass. Why do you do that? How do you do that? What, what does it do to the, to the performance and to the, to the uh, quality of the space, to the quality of the campus or whatever the building is located? And so it's a quick discussion on four examples. But actually, the, those windows are actually very good examples of the integrated approach that we use for design. And more and more, they include um, incredibly complex technical studies and analysis that go along with the uh, more conventional architectural forces. 
So we're going to look at these four windows. And you can see why I call them super windows. They, they are uh, entire sides of buildings for the most part. Each one of these have different reasons for existing and, and uh, different solutions to different problems. So again, they, they could be designed by four different architectural firms. They don't have an aesthetic theme. They have uh, a, a kind of a more of an, uh, uh, a common approach to a resolution to a very complicated, multifaceted problem. So the first one is not far from here, is in um, uh, Westport, um, in Massachusetts, called uh, close to Fall River. And it's, a, it's kind of a, not a typical building that we design. It's for a company. It's for a medical device company. And it's kind of an office building. Um, and uh, the location of the building is what uh, kind of called for this window, and it's it's really on the on right in, on, on facing this incredible pond. Um, so one entire face of this building, the building is located as you see there in blue, is located along the shore, and that entire face is window, and that was the single kind of again and a, a clear party for the building. So let me go to this one first. This is why the window is there. This is how these offices work. It's an open office. There's nothing complicated about the idea. In fact, the only complication here is to make it happen with a kind of an obsessive focus. So these are the open offices facing uh, the south, facing the, the pond. And you can see some of the other closed rooms and offices facing the highway. Um, so. The notion here was to treat that wall as, with as much clarity and transparency as possible. Again, pretty straightforward. So in order to do that, first the structure was actually independently placed, separated from the wall. And to avoid the chunkiness of a four-story curtain wall, the wall was actually hung from the roof. So there's, there's a structure beam right there, the wall is completely hung from the roof. And that helps uh, kind of lighten it with making the components a lot lighter. And then that requires just a few details to introduce lateral force and wind resistance to this wall with as few structural members as, as possible. And the result is a, a very clean uh, wall. Even in the oblique, you get a lot of clarity. You can see the structural members and the wall hanging from the roof. And the result is absolutely clear. Um, and again, it's, a, it's an obsessive clarity of purpose that leads to it. The second example is at George Washington University, in Washington, D.C., School of Public Health. Um, and again, what this is doing is creating kind of more of a, uh, a less of a single plane of window, but a very, a very rich uh, wall to the city. And why is that there? That is there because this is the location of the building. This is the campus. That's Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington Circle. That's the site. So it, it's the northwest corner, but it's the f it's the first thing that that people see of this campus is the kind of the. the the advertisement is, is the kind of spearhead of the campus on the city. So this is the location. So there's kind of side streets, but there's, there's the front street. And this line kind of of the circle and returning back to the street became an important line. So what the building, the, the way the building is organized is all about that one orientation. So the classrooms and enclosed uh, auditoria and so on are actually detached from that window. And what actually is touching the window, it's either open space or is these terraces for informal uh, gathering and informal um, uh, study areas or group uh, uh, connections between students and students and faculty. So. Essentially, what you have on this pink line, this curvy uh, uh, zone here is facing the uh, Washington Circle. So what you see is really not so much 
blank and block rooms, like this one that doesn't want a lot of windows. But what you see is activity and vibrancy. And that was a simple idea, but it's a very complex problem. You can see some of those rooms separated and the small scale intimate space that, that that gap creates between the window and those. And there's uh, perhaps a hundred different conditions that are created by the, the kind of uh, informal geometry of this approach. And here's a model showing kind of the, the almost casual nature of that to kind of uh, display this incredible vibrancy and dynamic life of the building towards that super important orientation in the city. And you can see uh, during construction, you could start to get an idea of what is going on here. This is going to be something really, really different. And um, you could not understand the shape of the window by just looking at this because of the complexity. Um, but the window is, in fact, a fairly regular nine seg segments that provide that curve. And at the end of the day, it creates a uniform but incredible, incredibly rich um, piece of information about what's going on inside. In Ireland, uh, a few years ago, we designed uh, three buildings on a campus. One of them was a humanities, uh, humanities research, uh, research building. And the building was to be an extension and attached to the main central library. The library and the science center that you see here, an incredible piece of mid-century modern architecture, really. Uh, fairly uh, cold environment, but, but um, a, an amazing kind of intervention on, on, on a green piece of land. That's the main library. And this is one of the, one of the front doors of the university. The campus, the, the formal door is here but there's only a couple of other ways of entering. So this small addition, it's about 80,000, 70,000 square feet, was to provide space for research and other miscellaneous activities. And it was to provide also uh, to be connected, physically connected to the main library. So this is the kind of what the building is trying to do. And again, fairly straightforward, enhance the campus and promote collaboration. Those are the two that I, <laughs> I think are uh, kind of commonplace in these kinds of buildings, but, th but they're as uh, complex uh, uh, issues as, as you can have. The result was this building in dark blue and a kind of a shared atrium in between them and reorienting the door. So the door to the entire complex would be from that side. But a wall here facing west, unfortunately, uh, it, it was kind of to create this new piece of campus. So this is the ground floor uh, where you can see that common space and a new entrance into the existing library. And the idea was to create a new entrance there, but a, a kind of a fabulous, much needed activity, outdoor activity space or, or a gathering space for the campus in a, in a very difficult place. And that note of intensity is what the campus needed. Uh, and that was created by um, a couple of things. One was that nexus in itself, separating the new building from the old with all its activity and its common entrance. And it became kind of a very important event space for the campus. But also outside, uh, creating the, the steps. And, and um, in, in the afternoon, there's a lot of sun, which is a very valuable commodity in Ireland. But back to the window. Um, these are the reading rooms. This is a section without its wall. So the design had to provide this incredible window, but it was facing west. So the reading rooms were aligned uh, along the face. And the window was actually uh, had to fight the environmental conditions and had to do it in an efficient way that would perform very well. And you can see here on the right, the reading rooms and two floors and the two-story wall. It's a simple two-story wall. And the solution was a basically a um, series of units and a cavity of two double glazed um, uh, pieces of, of, of conventional glass assembled in a custom aluminum system, ventilated so to create a, a vented cavity and with automated and integrated 
shades inside. By treating the glass, uh, now you have uh, eight faces of glass to deal with, we were able to reduce the heat gain and to maintain a very good level of, insulation, of isolation there. And the glare was dealt with with this integral system of shades that is automated. And you can see that even the windows, the inside layer is actually operable, so you can go in and maintain, clean, and, and work with the shades. So the window had to be there, even though the location was challenging. And that is the same kind of issue that we encountered in Amherst College, um, the new science center that opened months ago, I would say, less than a year ago. Um, again, a, a, a fantastic display of fantastic activity in an incredible building and a small campus that very much needed a building like this. The building is actually enclosing now a very nice open area, um, but it's oriented this way where the, 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 the main face of the building towards the campus was facing west. Um, and you can see here the open space that it frames and the vibrancy and, and energy that comes from that building towards the campus during the day and, and day and night. Um, so here's a, a diagram of the building where in orange here you see the common area that links the entire complex, three pavilions in front and, and the main blocks of the program in the back. But there's a lot of work that this one piece of the building um, has to do. On the level on level one, you have what's called the living room, and on levels two and three, it's just the same window that keeps going all the way up. Again, a single-minded, purposeful design of a glass wall. So here's a view of that wall and what it looks like inside, be becoming again the, the main living room for the entire campus, really. And that is combined with a with a beautiful space right at, outside of it. Uh, to create this combination of inside and out for year-round kind of generation of a, a magnet for the entire campus. So again here there's a small canopy there but the rest of the glass like we saw in the first example I showed uh, two things happen here. One is again it's hung from the structure on the roof so again to lighten up the entire system. In this case though the columns are not three feet away but all the way back even behind the balconies, to really create this unencumbered space, getting the columns out of the way. And still, this entire wall had to be hung from it. So here's a gigantic cantilever that does that. Um, and uh, you could see that all that was done to, again, get the clutter out of the wall. And the wall, indeed, is, 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 a, is a, a piece of jewelry, almost minimum minimum sections um, and, and very high performance. Uh, and um, one of the things that is interesting here is that by hanging the, f the, the wall from the roof, you were able to do very small horizontals, therefore creating the opportunity for the air to flow along the glass without being interrupted by the mullions that typically are six or eight inches and blocking the flow of air. And in combination with the shades that come down when they have to come down um, in, in this, in, to, to control the issue of glare, creates actually and helps a flow of air that actually uh, becomes a convecting force to cool the space, uh, combined with uh, <coughs> radiant strategies and, and a very sophisticated way of, uh, of moving the air in and out of the space and then feeding it again to, uh, for recovering energy. So again, a, a concept of uh, a glass, the aluminum or the, the structure of the curtain wall, the shades and glare control, all in the service of this single-minded idea of opening up this window and, and uh, using whatever techniques and tools we need to um, appeal to or develop to get to that place. So again, um, that was just kind of a, a, a window into our practice a little bit. Um, and I thought that this issue of the um, technical challenges presented by design 
are, are, are worth it when that, the idea is in service of the program and the people and the client. So um, I, I, I think that concludes what I wanted to share with you today. I think this is a, our new model, by the way. Um, and people seem to be enjoying that. Um, so thank you. I'm uh, available for any questions you might have about things I showed or things that I didn't show. The research projects uh, are pretty varied in, in their scope. Um, many of them have to do with um, very particular technical challenges, um, and others are more general. So for example, um, there has been a research study on uh, the, the use of unprogrammed informal space in buildings. So it's very non-technical, but actually can become fairly complex, which is actually a very important issue in planning buildings, where clients are generating and crafting a program, a space program for a building. Uh, so w whenever you have space that is not directly assigned to a, to a particular program, um, what is the value of that, and, and how is that used? And you have a lot of examples in this very building of circulation space that actually is essential to the interaction between people. We had research projects um, related to ventilation in healthcare, for example, uh, natural ventilation in healthcare. In other words, something that has traditionally been the essence of healthcare design, which is get fresh air into our buildings for, I don't know, 500 years or so. Uh, that got dropped completely in the 20th century and, and that was a very uh, directed research program trying to find the value and the possibilities and opportunities for natural ventilation in patient spaces in hospitals, um, which relates very much to the second third of, of the talk today. The last one I'm going to mention is the glazing tool, uh, which is a piece of software and application, really that allows people to actually input a tremendous amount of variables on a design problem and get uh, feedback on, on the impact of the glass on, on human comfort. So with different geometry, or different, different parameters, you can actually play up and down those parameters and understand the comfort factor of people that are close to that system. And that has been widely use across the world. We, we actually published these research um, uh, projects into either reports or, or widely available, make them available online. So those, those are three that, that I can mention to you. Sure. So the, f the, the Fab Lab really, what it is, is a model shop of big things and complicated things. So they have toys that we can't really have in our model shop in, 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 in our floor. So it's, it's a remote space that we lease for that. So that's kind of the general picture. The way we are using that is evolving. Um, and the intent is really to use that resource to inform technical design decisions, to go through iteration 
an understanding of design with a hands-on uh, approach as opposed to a software or just uh, kind of a modeling type of uh, approach to actually build the thing and understand how pieces go together and how it performs and what it looks like in real size. Very often, those are questions that come up early in design. Somebody on the team might think, here's something we can do here, but I don't know if it's possible. I've never seen it, but it sounds like a good idea. And the client might say, I don't know. I, I, I don't trust that that's a good idea yet because I have never seen it. So in that case, we might actually go to, to, to the Fab Lab and actually build the thing and figure it out and collaborate with builders and suppliers and hardware stores around the area, build, find a, a way of assembling, building, designing the piece, and learning from it. So first we learn from it. Once we think that the assembly or the piece is worthy, we take it to the client and we say, here, look, it actually works and this is how it works. And this is what we learn. So by the time we are actually designing it and documenting it for construction, we already been through an iterative process of figuring out how it works, whether it works. And um, uh, beyond that, I, I think uh, there's projects that we do in the Fab Lab where we actually help the builders to implement the design that we documented in, in our plan. So um, I think on this pedestrian bridge on Northeastern, the kind of the cordon steel bridge that you saw there, um, we actually assisted the, the contractors execute pieces of that because the details were so particular and tricky. Is that fair to say, Park? Okay. It's also a tool for communication at the end of the day. Do we have one more question? So you had uh, mentioned with the design projects in China, that was like one of the plans, like one of their first tries in hospital design stage in China. And I'm just wondering, by sometimes designs have uh, cultural implications, did you guys find that this like idea of embed in nature, which is something that is a very human idea of everyone interacting with nature, was that able to like transcend any cultural boundaries you might have otherwise faced? Do you, do you all hear the question? Uh, excellent question, by the way. Um, there's a lot in there. Um, this is what I can tell you. Um, there is a cultural um, gap in between, you know, these are very different countries and uh, certainly our team didn't have a lot of experience working in China. So there's a lot of issues that we encounter that require a lot of um, uh, negotiation in the dialogue. That particular issue of embedding nature has never been a problem, I would say that I can't, I'm not an expert in China just for working on two projects, so I can't tell you if this is a Chinese issue. It's more of the owners, the clients of these two particular, three really, particular projects have been very enthusiastic about the idea. Um, I think they were actually expecting that, to tell you the truth. Um, looking at um, other projects that I see other American firms um, are designing in China from what you see, which is what they want to show you. You don't always see this uh, in, in, in uh, a kind of in, in such a kind of a committed way. But I can't tell you that there's that would have been a lot easier to convince an American client of any of those things. So I, I don't think that was an issue at all. In fact, um, I think what. The client, again, was kind of expecting us to push on that front. And they were very, very receptive. If they were not receptive, they, they wouldn't actually build it. They would just not build it. And, but they, they, they are. So yeah. I have a follow-up to that. Did Feng Shui come part of the dialogue uh, when you were working in China? It sure did. 
Um, so we have, um, it's interesting because um, I'm certainly not an expert, but we do have uh, folks in our team that actually know a lot more yeah, in the team here. And, and there, there haven't been like a formal feng shui review of the project, but it comes so natural to them to look at the world that way that actually many of the comments that they have about the design turns out uh, are kind of compatible or aligned with feng shui issues. So that, that is very helpful. We, we had to learn very quickly a lot of the basic concepts. Uh, and again, some, some folks at Payette have a lot of background in that, and that was very helpful. But the, the answer is absolutely yes. Okay. Um, so we have the great exhibition that everybody should see. I think there are some snacks. Uh, and thank you, Leon, and thank you, everybody from Payette. For